Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. We're slowly recovering from all the illnesses. Our congregation is growing again. But join with us as we open our worship this morning with holy ground. Stand with us as we sing. This morning comes from Psalm 19. There are some scriptures in the seat back in front of you if you want to grab one. Uh, grab the Bible, open it to about the very middle, you'll hit the book Psalms, and then you can turn to Psalm 19. We're going to read the whole psalm, and it should be on the screen above. This is the time where we... You just going to stay back there? You, want, you ready? All right, kids. You get to miss the call to worship. Hey, Maddie, hey, Maddie, did you give her the message? Did mom get the message? You didn't? You will. <laughs> Kids are reliable messengers. I've learned that. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we get to the call to worship, let's, let's pray. 
Father, we bless you this morning. Um, we praise you this morning. It's a joy uh, to sing praises and worship you this morning. And we, we thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity, the privilege uh, of assembling together, encouraging and blessing one another, praying for and fellowshipping with one another. Uh, and we're grateful for those who have brought their children this morning, for parents or grandparents or friends that have, have brought the children this morning, uh, demonstrating the, the priority of, of worship, uh, the priority of fellowship with God's people. And so as those kids go downstairs with the volunteers, oh God, I pray that they would, they would find joy, uh, that they would be loved unconditionally, and they would see what the love of Jesus looks like. So bless not only the children just with a glorious time there, bless the volunteers, and thank you, O oh God, for those who have brought them out this morning. Uh, when they could be doing a hundred other things besides worship, I thank you that, uh, that they made it a priority and, and, and you bless that. So as we turn to your word even now, O oh God, we ask that you would bless us and help us to focus on you and your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm, one, Psalm 19, what is the title? Can, if, for you that have it open, what is, what is the title of, says the what, of the psalm? All right, the witness of the perfect revelation of the Lord. And so this is the word of the Lord for his holy word. That's right. The heavens, the heavens, they declare the glory of God. That's the goodness of God, the provision. And the firmament, that's the dry of the land, it shows his handiwork. His creativity, his awesome power. Day unto day unto day unto day, other speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their, their line or their, their business, another translation says, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Converting the soul... The testimony of the Lord is, is sure, it's certain, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is what? It's wisdom as we see in other scriptures. But it says the fear of the Lord here is clean and it's enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. <clears throat> Together, what we've read in 1 through 9, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. <clears throat> and they're also sweeter than the honey that's in the honeycomb. Moreover, here it is, here's the summary. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Not just by reading them, not just by, but there is great reward. Who can understand his errors and cleanse me from secret faults? Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins and let, and let them not have dominion over me. And then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of the great transgression. And then here's the scripture that we all know by heart. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And that comes as a, as a summary, as a charge, as an encouragement to what we read about our God of glory in Psalm 19. Let's continue our worship. Stand with us as we sing. Thank you. 
encourage you, if there's a Bible in the seats in front of you, to grab that and to use it. And if you don't have a note sheet, that you would uh, either raise your hand or get up and grab one of the note sheets. There's two different ones. One is from Cody's message last week, and then there's the one that uh, that I'll be using that I'll be using this morning. We'll spend most of our time only in one chapter of the Bible, and what a chapter! What a chapter that is. If you can't see me on the sides, I'll try to do like Cody and back up a little bit here. Hey, if I were to challenge you uh, this year to do one of two things, either read the New Testament through in its entirety twice through the year or memorize one chapter of Scripture. Read the entire Bible through twice in one year, the New Testament. Read the entire Testament through or memorize one chapter of the Bible. Put you on the spot here. How many would choose to, to read the Bible rather than memorize? Be honest, raise, okay. And, and, and so I assume to others of you, go ahead and raise your hand right now. You would rather memorize a chapter of Scripture. Did you just commit to reading the New Testament through twice? I think you did. The video will attest to your hand, so I'll see how we progress this year in that commitment. Thank you, I saw those hands. Last, uh, oh, one other question before, and I already asked a couple of people this. How many of you on every Sunday morning or a certain day, because of the notifications on your phone, get a message that says your screen time is up or down and here's how much time you're on your phone? How many get one of those? Raise your hands high, real high. Here you go. Okay, a lot of you, a lot of you do that. Uh, the others of you get it, you, you probably just ignore it. Last week, right here, we heard one of the most powerful, one of the most needed, and one of the most timely messages, I believe, that's been delivered here since I've been here in nine years. That includes any message that I've been given, and that's not false humility. It was just a, a powerful message. And if you were not here, uh, call the office, get with me, we'll send you a link. You can just push a, 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 a line, and it'll pop up Cody's message to you. I listened to it this week, and, and, and I've uh, dissected his notes from the sermon. And if any of you want notes of his sermon, you let us know, and we'll see what, what, uh, in what form you would like those notes to read them as, he, as you go back through his message. But his, his message was a call to every single one of us. It wasn't something that was just general. It was a call to know God. To know God. It was a call... To, to love God, and knowing Him is to, to love Him. And then it was a call to confession and repentance for neglecting God and for neglecting His, his Word. He also uh, dealt with the, the corruption of, of God's Word. So my question is, for those that were here and those that have seen it since then, did it strike a nerve? Did it make us more sensitive? Did it cause anybody, no hands here, but did it cause anybody this week to be a little bit more diligent in the Scriptures? A little more faithful to God's Word, or maybe even your reading plan that you have. Did it, did it at, at the least, did it unsettle us some? In that some of what He said was true about us. Those of us who, who call ourselves people of the, of the book, This is from his message. How many of us here this morning are in, and especially this week, we discern that we're in a slow, dangerous slide, ignorant of God's word through lack of discipline, through neglect, or disregard, or a lack of love? How many of us have discerned that we're on a, a slide away from those things? How many of us are hanging on by a thread of faith even without knowing it up until last week's message. So you could not come and hear the message and the Spirit of God not leave a mark on our lives because He knows the truth about all things. How many thought last, as before last week's message that you were swimming deep in, in clean water only to find out that you were wading in ankle-deep water? 
or you thought your glass was full and overflowing to find out really your glass is empty. It was that kind of message. 1 Timothy 3, 5 through 7. If a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Verse 7. More, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the share of the devil. The appearance of godliness, but taking power. That was a scripture I was looking for. Always learning, but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. What Cody's message did for us, and I'm going to camp on that this morning, and this is a, it, this is, this is not, this is a message of a different kind, and, and that I hope that it draws us all in, into, into the God of the Word, not just this book that we struggle with. We, we find it easier to read a book about a book than read the book. It's easier to read a book about a book than to read the book. And, and, and it's, more, it's about more than, than this material item that we have in front of us this morning. And hope you have one there. So we're going to look at making God's Word a life's priority. What, what has to happen and why should, we, why should we suddenly really evaluate whether, whether what we find here and who we find here is a priority in our life? When we talk about quality time and, and God's Word being a priority, uh, sometimes our approach is, well, that's a good idea. Well, that's something I might consider if this sermon's really good. That's an interesting thought. That's something I might consider. See, we consider it and we, and we think about it and we... Up until there's a death, there's a crisis, or there's a tragedy. And then suddenly... Or there's pain. There's the real one. There's pain. Emotional, uh, uh, relational, or physical. And then that will drive us to God's Word. We want to go, well, why, why me? Why this? Why now, God? Show me right here. We dealt with that through James. And so suddenly God's Word becomes a priority when certain things we want fixed or removed from our life. And so then time in God's Word and making it a priority is more than interesting, more than considerable. It's, it's, it's more than, than that. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see. Not that the book is good. Taste and see that the, the Lord is good. And then that's more than a caveat. It's an assurance of God. Blessed is the man who trusts in him by faith. I'm not just talking about salvation there. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This morning, I want to encourage all of us, I want to encourage each of us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And I'm talking about with our teeth, I'm talking about with our tongues, I'm talking about with our guts, I'm talking about with our colon, I'm talking about taking and eating. What does Jeremiah 15, 16 say? Anybody know? It says, your words were found, O Lord. And what did he say after that? Who knows? I ate them. That's exactly right. I ate them. Really? That's like one of those metaphors, right? No. You find somebody that's deep in God's word and makes God's word a priority, and you, you can see in their flesh that they have eaten, eaten God's word. And so if that's a silly notion to you, Hold on this morning. And so we need, to, we need to read to live like our life depended on what we, we read because it does. And that was, that was Cody's message. It is life or death. To neglect God's word is, 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 is a great and tragic danger. And we know people who, who are in that camp. This comes not from my own words. This comes from a, a, a book by uh, um, Eugene Peterson. He says, we should read the scripture. Reading the scriptures is not an activity discreet from living the gospel, but one that's integral to it, all right? It means, here it is, letting another have a say in everything that we are saying and doing. 
come into this word and, and, and it having the proper place and posture, we're allowing someone to say something about everything that we say and do. And we said, well, that's too invasive. In some cases, you're saying, well, that's easy. In some cases, we say, oh, well, that's, that's hard. So let's go to the Word and see what the Word says about making God's words our priority. All right, and we're going to be in Psalm 119. So that's right, we'll provide lunch and dinner, and we'll cover all 176 verses of Psalm 119. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 119. You, you, you'll, find, you'll find a blessing in not only hearing God's Word, but seeing God's Word and reading God's Word. I won't have you read after me in any way. Well, you know, God's Word ought to have priority because it's God's Word. There was a time in my life I've told too many stories about my dad that I feared my dad more than I feared God. I figured I was out of reach of God. I was never out of reach of my dad because of a whistle. We won't go back there. So we say, well, we, we know what we know about God's Word. We say that, but why and how should we prioritize God's Word? Well, first of all, we're going to look at Psalm 119, and, and as always, I pray that in with Cody's sermon, it just comes up out of the text. You see it. It's not something I'm having to drive you back to. So we prioritize God's Word because it has authority. We prioritize things in our life that have authority. For those of you who are students, you, you, your, your teachers in your life have more authority than your neighbor, though they don't even live close to you. So think about those in your life who have priority over you. Well, it's your parents. Cheryl's mom can get her to do things I can't get her to do, and she loves me. She loves her mom. But her mom has some authority over her still at 92 years old. Your boss has authority over you. You'll stay late. You'll leave early. You'll do this. You'll do that. We all have a boss. Everyone's under authority. Right? Everyone. We'll go to that scripture verse. Teachers. Teachers have authority over us. Anyone who teaches us. Medical doctors have authority over this. You disregard my words and we'll see you at the hospital. Right? Take this, this many times, do this. We let strangers open up our bodies. We trust, uh, they have authority over us. And certainly police have authority over us. When they speak, we what? Y yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right, sir, yes. We listen and we o obey. And the obedience is we prove receptivity. And most of you have kids. Now, you're going to do this, you know, what did I say? And we ask the kids to say back exactly what we said or what we want them to do. Otherwise, it'll get, it'll get conflated later. So we prioritize God's Word because it has authority. And the authority is not just because God says so. So let's look at Psalm 119. Look at verse 1 right out the gate. Blessed, blessed are the undefiled in the way. Those who walk in the law of of the Lord. Does the law have authority? Well, absolutely it does, we would say. Blessed are other trans they say, blessed are the pure who walk in the law of the Lord. That word law is going to be used 25 times just in this one psalm. So what comes to your mind when you hear the word law? When you hear the word law, what, well, it's those blue lights in your rearview mirror and the guy in the uniform who walks out and, and asks you for your license and your registration. And you hope that's all he wants. It's maybe I've got to go to jury duty, and I'm not just going to show up and group of people just slap me on the back. There's going to be a judge up there, and this judge is going to tell me, that, and he's going to say, you're here to, to uphold the law. You're here to ensure that the law is fairly dealt with. And so we see a judge, and he's wearing a robe for crying out loud. He's not dressed like you and me. So what comes to your mind when you hear the word law? Is it a negative? Oh, it's legalistic. Oh, don't go there, Bill. It's grace, 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 not the law. And so do you think when you hear the law, do you think, well, the Ten Commandments? All right? Watch how you use the Lord's name. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't lie. 
Do we think of the Ten Commandments when we think of the law? Is that it? Cody referenced that. Maybe some of you here are more mature in the Scriptures, and when you hear the law, immediately you go to the first five books of what? Of the Scripture. There's where we're going to really find the law kind of codified. And then there's a, a scarce few in here. When I said the law, here's what loaded. All of Scripture. All, all of Scripture speaks authoritatively, uh, authoritatively to us, or do we just pick and choose? God's law is not a list of do's and don'ts. It reveals God's will and, and how God's people are to live relationally, not academically. It's not just to know this, but it's, it's to do this. And so, does God and His Word speak to you authoritatively? When you go to it, do you, do, you, do you sometimes come away with a little bit of fear and trembling because God has spoken authoritatively and now all our response is, well, I, I do what He says. I mean, after every cop says, well, slow it down, don't speed anymore, we never speed after that. Exactly. And so God says, slow down. <laughs> right, right. God's Word speaks to us suggestively. It speaks to us occasionally. It even speaks sometimes, sadly, capriciously. But it's amazing, a man in a uniform can stand in our window and have more authority over us than God's Word. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. Verse 2. I told you, lunch and dinner. <laughs> Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with his whole heart. God's word, it, 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 it has authority, and we see it in God's testimonies. All right? That's where God's testimonies bear witness to who God is. Not what he says, but, but, but who he is. That's what God's testimonies do, and that's used ten times just in this song. Now, the interesting thing through research for this message, this word testimonies, blessed though keeps God's testimonies, they have a flavor of, and a nuance of warning in who God is. Boy, that has changed everything since I came across that, even preparing for this. You see, truth is a person, and that person is Jesus. And so it bears witness to who God is, and it does so with warning. Do, do you know who he is? Do we really know who he is when we, when we come to him in his word? God's word authoritatively bears witness through his testimony of who he is. And we could, we could recite for hours who he is. And so his testimonies have authority. Verse 3, his ways. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. We look at his testimonies, the law of the Lord, and his ways. It refers to God's character and his manner of acting, how he deals with us, his, his predisposition. So are you, walking, are you walking with God's word for the, for the composite part of your life, or do you tend to be walking against God's word? Every time I come to this, he's against something. Every time I come to this, he's convicted me of something. Every time I come to this, I'm, I struggle or do you feel like that, that in that flow of God's word, his testimonies, his ways, his will, his instruction, that you're moving with the current of God? And it's encouraging, sustaining, blessed are those who do know iniquity and they walk in God's ways. Verse 4, you have commanded us, to keep your, uh-oh, here's another word, precepts diligently. Those are principles and particular instruction that flows out of the character of God. Because of God's character, he can't, he can't confuse that. He can't contradict that. And so those are his principles and, and his particular instruction that just flows out of who he is. 
and they're practical. These aren't academic things. They're very detailed. And so we see that God's precepts have authority because it's rooted in his character. And then verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your... Uh, here's another one. Statutes. They speak about force and permanence. Statutes. When we think about a statute, we think about a statue. A statue is made out of what? Cardboard? No. What do we make statues out of? Granite and stone and marble. Why? Because we want them to be there for a long time. So it has this, this message of permanence and it speaks with force. It's like words engraved in a stone. We know that it takes a great amount of time, if ever, and weather to erode that. It's, oh, that my ways were directed to keep your, your statutes. Those things that he speaks about forcibly and, 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 and that should establish permanence in our lives. They're decrees of a divine ruler, which is our heavenly Father. So God's precepts, his statutes, his ways, his testimonies, the law of the Lord, they all speak authoritatively to our lives. But that's not it. We'll, we'll quickly cover the, the next three. Verse 6. Then I would be ashamed when I look into all your, uh, there it is, commandments. Orders from, from one who has absolute authority over us. That's used 22 times in this psalm alone. Verse 7 is going to talk about judgments. I'll praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn of your righteous judgments. That's justice that's rooted in the unchanging character of God. You'll never go to God and, and, and get treated unjustly. You'll never go to God and hear anything unrighteous. And so we, we find God's commandments and his judgments. Those are used 25 times each. And in God's judgments, it's where he chooses and he decides in our, in our common human situations. Then 9 and 11, how can a young man keep his way pure? By, keep, by he, taking heed according to your word. In verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart. That what? That I might not sin against you. Not that I might not by break the rules. I may mess up on one of these commands. No. That I might not sin against you. And this word here in, in verse 11 is the most general term. It's more general than all the other statutes and laws and, and, uh, that, that we looked at this morning already. And so the word there signifies God has spoken and God has promised. It, it will come to pass because God is a God of truth and he will never speak a vain word. He will never speak an idle word. He only speaks truth. So... Those are just a few, of, just in the first few uh, uh, verses of Psalm 119 that deals with God's Word having authority in our life. And I wonder how, how eye-opening was that to us. You mean all that too? You mean that really has that kind of significance in who God is? And, it should, and so anyone having that kind of authority should have some priority in, in our, our lives. And so you have to ask yourself, what needs to change in your life? What needs to change in order, in order to make God's Word a priority? And it's not just, <clears throat> well, let's go to the second reason. We need to, the Bible needs to be prioritized in our life because it's, it's reliable. It's God's reliable word to us. That means reliable. It bears up under any weight that you place on it. What in your life will bear up under any weight that you put on it or anyone else's? Well, there's nothing. I've even found things that that super glue won't bind together and won't hold up. You know, they, they say in the commercials it'll hold up anything. Well, that's not true. It, it won't bear up under that. But God's word, every, every statute, every law, every command, everything we just looked at will hold up under any weight you put on it. You can trust God's word. It's inspired. It's not just men's words. It's infallible. It's inerrant. 
But what does the scripture say about the reliability of God's word? Well, let's look at that. Flip over to Psalm, uh, uh, verse 86 of this psalm. Hope you're making some, some notes here, and you can have my notes after, after this as well. You can trust God's word. Verse 86, all your commandments are what? Are faithful. They persecute me wrongly. They persecute me, but you're, you're, you're faithful. Verse 138, we're going to move these, through these pretty quickly. 138, your testimonies which you have commanded, they are righteous and they're faithful. God's word is reliable. It's, his words are righteous. Look at 140 and see what it says. Your words are, are pure. They're, they're not diluted. They're not contaminated. Your word is pure, and therefore your servant loves it. And then verse 151. You are near, O God, and all your commandments are true. We can trust God's word as reliable because it's faithful. It's, he's righteous. It's righteous. It's pure. It's truth. And then we're... Verse 160 kind of sums it all up, if you'll look at 160. The entirety of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous judgments endure, they last forever. What what in your life is faithful? What in your life is righteous and pure and true and also practical? The Word of God speaks practically and relevantly to every single person. Not only every single person, but every society. Not only every person in society, but every culture. And it does so from when it began to when it ends. It does, it endures, what does the Scripture say? Does that call us in? Hearing these things, do we say, oh, that's prickly. Or do we see this as something that in that flow of God's word that, we're, that, that, that we see it begin to carry us and we say, may it be so, Lord Jesus. Or do we want to just kind of hold up our hands when the gospel writers speak the word, when the minor prophets and the major prophets speak God's word, when Ignatius and Polycarp or Justin Martyr, they spoke words to us, We read sermons by Calvin and Spurgeon and Edwards. God's Word still speaks faithfully, righteously, purely, inerrantly, and infallibly. And we think, well, you're you're kind of overloading me right now, Pastor. There's a little bit too much to even think about. That's why you have a note sheet and you make notes and come back and pray through some of this. This is a hard message to know which target group are we going to preach to this morning. But here's the here's why. For those of you that have to have not proofs, not evidences, but you have to have reasons that, that <clears throat> as to the reliability of God's Word. The answers to all of the problems men face today are in God's Word. Now, I'm not going to stop there. They are in God's Word because... It speaks to our human condition and the need which has not changed since the garden. No, I'm better than that. I know more than that. I'm not like that. We begin to to, to possess self-righteousness and compare ourselves to others. We're we're sinners in need of God's grace all the time. And so that's why we need the reliability of the authority, authority of God's Word. Because of the... Because I know what's in my heart. You know, Cody stood right here and he wept real tears. Tears for you and for himself. And anybody that's ever prepared a message like that understands. Woe be unto me. And that's what Isaiah kept saying. uh, Woe is me, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. See, that's why Satan ceaselessly tries to undermine the authority and the credibility of God's Word. See, that's what he's going to tell you. God's not reliable. God's not that, he, no, he's not that important. He wants to erode our belief in the sufficiency of Scripture. What do you say to you? Has God said? I mean, are you really sure about what God's Word said? What God said? Not just confusion, but doubt. So God's Word is authoritative. It's reliable. 
And if it is, then we'll read and study and we'll know. And we'll ingest. Remember, we'll eat. We'll eat God's, God's Word. There's a book by uh, Andrew Peters, Eugene Peters, and it's called Eat the Book. And it's really a remarkable. It's, it's, it's based on the verse in Jeremiah. It says, you know, I took the word and ate it. Uh, but it's a remarkable, and it's not something that you have to read to, to be convinced that that's what we want to do. Uh, it, it takes scripture and it expounds that. Would you think somebody was calling you a fanatic if they said, yeah, you're kind of a person that's, I can see you eating the book. I can see. Would that be a compliment? You know, we, we think about God's word. And as Cody brought it out real clearly, we live in a time where we can hear God's word just about any time, any place. And we just choose not to. We'd rather listen Not humorously. I am not trying to draw. I tend to spend too much time on sports radio. I just do. I mean, it's just going to here to Walmart. Does that really count? I'm not going all the way up the valley. I'm not going out to see, you know, the McCalls. I just tend to turn on talk radio. Well, why? Why not, why not you know, the, the other channels? We, 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 we have the opportunity to hear God's word. We can read God's word. We can, we can speak God's Word. We can write God's Word. And we struggle to get in His Word at, at, at all. Eat the Word. Is that a comical thought for you? Is that just a title of a book to you? Or is it something that might, might stand with you? God's Word is, is authoritative. It's reliable. But Psalm 119 is going to also tell us that God's Word is powerful. It saves, it redeems, it changes, it transforms, it sustains. The authoritative, reliable Word of God is powerful. And in its power, this psalm is going to show us that it, ha it has four effects in its power. You think, what can a really bad storm do? Well, I don't know, it blew some flashing off the side of our building. We've got men walking around with flashing. And what, what's going on here? You know, we know wind has certain things. When two cars collide, we know there's, there's some power there. God's Word is powerful. So the first thing we see, and we see it in verse 2, it's powerful enough to lead us into a living relationship with the living God. Now, that's power. That's power. Look at verse 2. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with the whole heart. We don't read and study God's Word to become scholars. That's not, that's not our motive. It's not to be moralist, to be morally more pure than others who may not know His Word, or even to be pietist, as Cody brought out last week. We need to read and study the Bible to seek God Himself. If there's a hurdle that we all have to get over, it's that. It's not out of compulsion but we want to know God himself, not just the, the data that's in this, in this book. The word brings us into a spiritual life and it sustains us in that life. That's what the, that's what the, 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 the contents of this book will do. James 1.18 says what? Of his own will he brought us forth what? By the word of truth. Right? Remember this to James? That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. A living relationship with a living God. That's how powerful God's Word is. And contact with God through His life-giving Word is vital. It, it should be what sustains our life. And we know how sustaining it might be. Look at verse 25. My soul clings to dust. Revive me according to what? according to your word. Look at verse 37. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. I wonder if a cell phone would come into that. We'll talk about that later maybe. And revive me in your way. In your way with your words. And then verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction. Your word has given me life. 
There's a dozen more refrains that are just like this. Cheryl's not here. She may be watching on the side, so forgive me. It's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. It's amazing, it's amazing how many times, far more times than ever would, Cheryl will be in a circumstance, in a condition, just in a situation, and she'll just say, read me scripture. It's not Christ, it's not life or death. We're not getting ready to go to the, she'll just say, read me scripture. And I'll say, what do you want me to read? Wrong answer, wrong question. Right? You don't do that. If your wife says that, just pick it up and read. And she'll just say, just read, just, just read God's word to me. Now, that's not being overly sanctimonious or holy. There's just time when she, she knows, she, it's not that she can't, but she wants to hear God's word. She wants to close her eyes, and she just wants to go, God, I, I've just got to change focus. I've got, to, I've got to change the scenery. I've got to change the spirit in the room. And she doesn't trust herself, because we'll always go to Romans 8, 28. We'll go to, you know, we'll go to our go-to verses. Pick the word and read and read. There's life-giving power in the Word of God because it, it, it brings a person into a living relationship with the living God. Now, that's power. But not only that, the Word gives us stability in our trials, and we all, we all go through trials. So look at verse 22. And here again, this is all just coming right out of Scripture. Remove, remove me from the reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. People were speaking against the writer. Against, I guess it's a presumed Ezra wrote this. They were speaking. They were murmuring about him. They were, they were talking bad about him. Anybody, that ever happened to you? People ever, ever speak against you? Look at verse 23. Princes also sit and speak against me. He was being afflicted, but your servant, he what? He meditates on your statutes. Runs to the word. Look at verse 51. The proud have me in great derision. Uh-oh. Yet I do not turn aside from your, from your law. So he was, they were speaking against him. They were afflicting him. Look at verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now, now what? I keep your word. Psalm 107, I mean, verse 107. I'm afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, what? According to your word. According to your word. It's going to keep coming back to... And then evil men were actually persecuting him. And look what it says in verse 84 and 80 through 87. He was being persecuted. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me and are talking about me? And are afflicting me. God, what are you going to do about it? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are what? Faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me. They almost made an end of me on earth. They almost took my very life. But I did not forsake your precepts, your word. God's word brings stability when we go through trials and difficulty and it's clear throughout scripture godly people are not exempt from lies affliction persecution or suffering second timothy three twelve says and yes all who desire to live godly in christ will suffer persecution is it god's word that brings us stability in our trials is that what it is thirdly god's word gives it has um has the power to give us direction in life to make wise decisions this is not being deluded. We're not going from greatest to least. We, we all need, we all need help, especially in these times, wise decisions. Because, see, our lives are really just a series of choices and decisions. Will I do this or not do that? Will I go there or not go there? This or that? These or those? We make hundreds of decisions in our lives every single, every single day. And God's not left us to ourselves. He's not left us to, to tend for ourselves. We can all too easily recount the, the cost and the consequences of an unwise decision. But how often are our testimonies more of where the glory of God for wise decisions? 
As your pastor, frequently, sometimes you'll call me and ask me, not for my opinion, but for help in a problem or a situation or a circumstance. Someone was experiencing a, a problem, uh, a recurring problem, and called me to ask me, uh, not, not, not my opinion, but just for some, for some wisdom. And what was amazing was this. We just went, we really just looked at the principles of God's Word, and it had to do with an automobile, and it took days and weeks to resolve it, and there were real, real crises in that. But the remarkable thing is this. I was blessed as I, I saw how God directed and gave wisdom because that's what was sought in God's Word. And maybe one day I'll get that person who's here this morning to tell a story about how God resolved because really it is, it's, a, it's, it's not amazing, it's God. How He gives direction when we come to His Word and we, and we trust it in His character. Wisdom is, is seeing things from God's vantage point. From a, it's all-encompassing, past, present, and future. Well, what, is Psalm 1, what does verse 105 say? It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That is an incredibly strong uh, illustration right there. Because we've all been in a place where we just need a little bit of light. We don't need a whole lot, God. We just need a little bit. And I don't need to know what's at the end of this street. I just need to know what, where to take the next step. We've all heard and we've all come back to this and, 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 and sometimes been misguided by it rather than God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Always. Not just when there's a problem. Verse, look at what, verse 130. Your, the entrance to your words gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Could you say amen to that? It's the appearing of, of God's Word. When God's Word shows up and we see what God says about it, we have His protect. You know what? We've got to run the other way to not do it. We really do. From our journey through James, we learn much about wisdom and the, the cost of unwise decisions. So we see the Word gives us direction. F lastly, it gives us joy and delight. God's Word gives us joy and delight. Do you find your greatest joys and your greatest desires in following Him or doing things your own way? For far too many professing believers, joy and, and delight are latent characteristics in our life. Meaning they're, they're not often on full display that a person is full of joy and full of, of delight. But God's Word, what does it say? Look at verse 14. I have rejoiced, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. Matter of fact, as much as in all riches. Oh, wait a minute. God's reading our, our bank statement now. God's God's going a little bit deeper here. I have rejoiced, joy. I have proclaimed the joy that God has given me by following his testimonies as much as I would find in all the riches. Could that be said of us? How about verse 16? I will delight myself, delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. How about verse 24? Your testimonies. Oh, they're also my delight, and they're my counselors. I don't run to flesh and blood. I run to you, and I find delight. How about verse 77? And there's others we could look at. I had to pick and choose through these. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live. Ah, for your law is my, is my delight. And then verse 92. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. Joy and delight. That's what God's Word. It's not something that we have to, to rub up. It's not something that we have to work up. Fruit of the Spirit that comes to us as we delight in God's Word. So joy comes from possessing the Spirit of the living God. And it comes from acceptance with grace 
things that God knows that we don't need in our lives for His reasons for Him to choose. Truthfully, we find too much delight and too much joy in the television set. We've got our, we've got our favorites. We do. We have to just be honest. We like entertainment. We do. That's not joy. That's not delight. It's mind-numbing. We love our iPhones. Many of you probably, and some of you have sent to me before, the things that says, if we only treated our Bible like we treat our iPhone. You know, we don't leave home without it. It's always, you know, it's always in our hands. Every time it dings, we run to it. You know, it tells us, what if we actually treated our Bible and what would that look like? It, it can be very convicting. But we, we look to, for, to our phone to give us delight and, and joy somehow. Video games. I'm not a video gamer. I've got other things that, you know, maybe it's just the bicycle that I like to ride. But there's other things that, that we think bring us joy and delight, but really they, they don't. This morning, um, I was finalizing part of the message, and um, I was over in my office, and my phone just dinged, and so I had to just glance over to it. When it dings, you got to look. But we do. When it dings, we look. And the message popped up, and it said, your screen time on your cell phone is up so many percent. And that equated to so many hours and so many minutes last week. Okay. And to be honest with my first one, that's wrong. That's got to be wrong. Where did that come from? I know my time. I know what I do. I don't even feel guilty. And now I'm, I'm not guilty. I'm angry. Because it chose to tell me that on Sunday morning before I preached. And I'm telling you, I was ashamed at how much time. I spent, because it was probably more time than I'd spent reading God's Word. And that was daily. Do you know there's a setting on your cell phone that will tell you how many times you pick up your phone and the screen just comes on? Whether you go to it or not, it'll tell you exactly how many times. Would it shock you to say that probably the average in here might be 250 times to 300 times a day? A day? A day? What if we just picked up our Bible five times today? This is the conviction that came to me. I'll meet with the deacons today because we're having a deacons meeting, but the one charge that I give the deacons is this. Please ask me how much time I'm spending in God's Word. If they're accountable to anything, it's how, how long are you spending in God's Word. So I want to encourage you. Without accountability, what we've talked about this morning, it's good, it's interesting. But it's not gonna. It's not gonna. It's not gonna last. It's not gonna last. So let me close by giving you some some things that will will help you, assist you, support you in making God's word a priority. If that's what you really want, I mean, here's where we got to get. We've got to get to the point where I'm tired, of, I'm tired of just the status quo. I'm tired of maintaining what I've maintained. I'm not in God's Word as much as I should be, could be, ought to be. I'm certainly convicted by what Cody said and even what you said this morning from Psalm 119, not Isaiah 5 and 8. I also would like to know how many people went back and read Isaiah 5 and 8 again or again or again. Cody started off in last week and he said, Disrespect, disregard for the Word of God is deadly. If we don't see that disregard, disregard for the Word of God is deadly, then everything else just falls on, on deaf ears. But disregarding God's Word is deadly morally, ethically, spiritually, and even physically. It's amazing how many people have physical issues that really are spiritual issues. Disregard. Is that kind of a strong word? Let me ask you, what if you disregard brushing your teeth for a year? Yes, yeah, gross, isn't it? 
Did he, nobody brush their teeth for a whole year? That's gross. Doc Nix is a dentist. I can't imagine what, you know, what, what you said, well, how'd, how'd you get in this? I mean, don't you, don't you have a toothbrush and toothpaste? You think, well, why would anybody do that? How about this, taking a bath? What if you just said, I'm not going to bathe this year? <laughs> we think, I mean, we, we think, we laugh at disregarding brushing teeth or using deodorant or anything. You know, we, we, we kind of mock people like that. But then we come back and we say, all right, what about disregarding the Word of God? Well, it's, it's deadly. And with tears, Cody said, and he shared that with you. Not for me. Nope. Not for me. Disregard for God's Word is deadly. Be forewarned. Disregard for God's Word makes us vulnerable makes us vulnerable to fall into hedonism. And, to, and, to, and to, it makes us vulnerable to listen to false teachers who say what, really what I want to hear, not what God says. And then it, 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 we, it makes us vulnerable to self-righteousness. I'm doing pretty good. I'm really a pretty good guy. I'm really not that bad. So let me give you some more helps. If you really want to take what Cody has said and what you've heard this morning and do more than apply it but live it, start with the easiest possible thing you can do. And that's fine and utilize a good translation. There's over 200 translations of the, of the Bible in English. Over 200. Which one is the best one? And the answer is the one you read every day. That's right. The one you read every single day. Find that one. And when people ask me that and I give them that answer, I've lost a friend. Because it's really not about the translation. It's really not. Secondly, it's more practical, be systematic based on your needs. Don't use the open the Bible message. Don't, don't use, start systematically, right? Begin in the New Testament. Start with the Gospels. And then, and then begin to, to look at the Psalms and the Proverbs. Be a little bit more hesitant to go back to the Old Testament until you have that foundation in the, in the New Testament. But establish a system. This is the first year I've not put out the, the ten or more reading plans, Bible reading plans, first time in nine years uh, for this year. And not one person has asked me for a copy. I don't say that condemningly. I just say that's the fact. That nobody said, hey, you got, that, you got one of those ten. They're all different. Find a system. You know, we all change oil in our car. We got a system for that. We change the filters in our house. We got a system for that. We got all kinds of systems in our life, but we, we don't have one that helps us get into God's Word as if it's a chore. So be systematic about what about your based on your needs. Be prayerful. Ask God to teach and help you and encourage you as you're reading. As you're reading and getting to know God. Ask Him to help you and to teach you and to encourage you. This may be the most convicting one. The next one, it's don't quit. Be persistent. I'm not going to ask how many of you made a uh, a resolution or or made a, what do you call them, a New Year's, New Year's, yeah, to exercise or to diet. Well, if you did, you've probably already fallen off the wagon. I mean, you just have. I, 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 I just, my son and my, my, my son, two sons and I are on a little program that, that one of them put together. Foolishly, I, I submitted to that, and I failed about 70% of the time and doing the four things that they say to do. And I'm pretty disciplined, but I still fail. So how many of you have already failed in your diet? How many of you have already failed in your exercise? Or failed in doing something that you said you wanted to do consistently this year? What, do you just give up? Just give up, that's it? I failed once, and so it's all over, that's the end. No, we get back on the horse. And we have somebody else that's in the plan with us that says, come on, you can do this. Let's get back on. Let's pick it up right here. So don't quit. Be persistent. If you mess up, you've messed up. If you miss a day, you miss a day. 
You know, the, the, the Vols lose a game. And we don't say, well, they're not my team anymore. Nope. They lost. No, we complain and we get all upset and then we, we root for them right along the next game, knowing we're going to be hurt and they're going to lose again. We do. But we don't give up on them, but we give up so quick, so quickly and easily on ourselves. Our mates and our spouses, they can help us and assist us with this. Practically apply what you read and learn. Now, how do you do that? By teaching what you've learned to someone else, by sharing it with someone else. You want to clear the line in Walmart? Ask the guy behind you, hey, you know what I learned in Scripture this morning? He'll find another line. Share it with the grandkids. You know what the, you know what the kids are learning downstairs? And I won't call any names, seriously. The books of the Bible. They're learning the books of the Bible. Heaven help us that our, our kids and our grandkids know more of the books of the Bible than we do downstairs in children's church. So nobody go down to children's church next week when they leave and go downstairs. Stay right here. Lastly, rejection of God's word is nothing less than a rejection of Christ himself. That's what Cody said. And that's what we need to hear over and over again. Not as a threat. Not as a threat. But this rejection of God's well, I don't reject God's word. How about ignore? Do you ever ignore God's word? Does God's word ever say, okay, the spirit of God gives you a word, you just ignore it? Do you disregard it? Thou shalt not speed. Thou shalt not take something that's not yours. Do we just disregard God's word? Do we just avoid God's word? Just whistle it away. Just avoid it. Do we defy God's word? Well, I know what it says, but this is a different situation and circumstance. Do we just neglect God's word? That's what it means. When we ignore, disregard, push aside, avoid, neglect God's word, we're really rejecting himself. This word, he's become flesh and dwelt among us. Well, Bill, adding another priority to my life right now is just not, not an easy thing to do, and it's something that I'll just be honest with you, I'm going to struggle with. Okay. And let it replace one of the other priorities. Whatever the other priorities are, just let it replace one of them. Figure out which one is not equal to the task. And just say, okay, Lord, let's just completely... I was wanting to get rid of that anyway. And if your wife's got a problem with you doing away with your diet to spend more time in God's Word, y'all come see me. And if, if your other spouse wants to do a lot more exercise, then that do away with the exercise and, and apply God's Word. Y'all come see me. If we just took a few minutes out of the day off our cell phone, we would have more than enough time to engage God in His Word. How, after looking at Psalm 119, and that's just a few of 174 verses, can we question or even put on pause making God's Word a priority in your life? If there's anything that can be said about First Baptist Church, this year, I, I, I would pray that as a result of Cody's message and this message and more reminders that are going to be coming to state, so if you don't like this mantra, it's not that sermon after sermon after sermon is going to deal with this, but if you don't like being brought back to this point again and again and again, I'm just telling you ahead of time, it, it's not going to die down. That they would say that's a church where the Word of God takes priority. Not just because of the way it's preached, but because of the way people live. The way we live in relationship with the God who gives us His Word. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for the grace that You have given us that knowing all this and having all this and, and doing all this, we still come before you this morning and we find that you're a God of great grace and compassion and patience and forgiveness. And as Cody wept and I cried out, Oh God, forgive us for all the things that we allow to take priority over you and your word. The things that so 
easily attract us. So, Lord, we pray for a sensitivity of your Holy Spirit. That you would, you would give us a desire, that you would give us a hunger to eat the Word and a thirst to consume the Word. That you might be glorified and all who know us and encounter us would see the, the Word of God and the truth of God, the power of God, the reliability of God, the goodness of God on full, full display. Deal with us now, O oh God, making our chair our altar or even using this one as we cry out, O oh God, for forgiveness, for encouragement, for guidance. Wisdom with your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing.
as part of the sermon, I think I, I mentioned that part of my testimony was that uh, uh, I was in a ministry. Um, I was just lost. I, I was just destroyed by sin, heavily addicted. I'm in a ministry that has Bible study, and it's supposed to last 30 days, and I'm in it for two years doing the same Bible studies over and over and over again because I'm at the end of my rope and I don't know where to turn and I feel like maybe Jesus is it. And as part of that ministry, there was a sermon by John Popper that I've mentioned. And his big thesis was this, is that if all the planets in your solar system, whether that be sexuality or desire or relationship or whatever, if they're smashing into each other and into destruction, Maybe it's because the sun at the center of your solar system doesn't have the weight and the gravity to hold them in alignment. And what he was explaining is that only Jesus Christ could take that role. And it's one of those powerful sermons I've ever heard preached. It's what God used to draw me to himself. And it's not because John Popper's a genius. He just took all the things that the word had to say about Jesus Christ and just put them together. And all it did is it took a print prick of light at the center of my solar system and turned it into that blazing sun that has the power and the authority and the weight to hold all those things in alignment. Amen. And so our verse today that we're going to end with is from Psalms 119, verse 92 and 93. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Let's pray together. Father God, your word is life and truth. Lord, by your word, you have revealed your son to us, and you have drawn us to yourself. Lord, without your word, how would we know that there's an answer for sin? How would we know our sin and our shame without your word? Lord God, your word, it brings light into darkness. But where we would all perish without it. And Lord, let us not turn our backs on the thing that brought us life. And Lord, we know that you are your word. Lord, it is not words on a page that have drawn us into the beauty of, and the joy of Jesus Christ. But it is you yourself. Lord, you have revealed yourself to us. We do not need to look to the sky and wonder what you want. You have revealed it. And Lord, what we have seen in your word is that you are full of love and mercy and grace, that there is escape from your justice and wrath and your righteousness in Christ. And Lord, we ask you for grace that we would be drawn to you. And because we are drawn to you and your son, that your word would have no greater place in our life than at the very top. Lord, we ask you that you would please give us desires or there are none that we would be drawn to your yeah. son, that we would know him, that we would press on to know him in this book that you have given us. And Lord, we ask you for this grace that you might be glorified in us and that we might be joyful and glad in you. And amen. amen. Sing with us. Yes, 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 yes. 
of Ezekiel. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide as a world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and now is Zion to salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun.